Well, the talk that you're about to watch was recorded as part of our Jesus is Greater Than series, a study through the book of Hebrews. It was recorded for our MP and Aura church congregations. If you find this content helpful, could I encourage you to like our Facebook page or go and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. But for now, it is my prayer that you might come to see through listening to these talks, the ways in which Jesus is so much greater than the things of the past and the things of this world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray this morning that you may open our hearts to your word and that you may draw us to focus anew on the Saviour who came to earth, Jesus Christ, who lived the life that we should have lived but we failed to, who took the death that we deserve and did it for us to bring us to heaven. Give us wisdom this morning, we pray. Amen. When you become a Christian, it's not like you join a local club where you get, you know, you sign up and you get, you know, discounts on meals or something like that. The church is not a club. The church isn't a place for passive members where you're served by others. No, the church, it's a little bit more like the storyline of The Hobbit or the the Lord of the Rings, when you become a Christian, you're joining, if you like, a band of brothers who are on a quest, who are going on a long walk to some faraway destination. They're setting out, in fact, for a lifetime journey, uh, a journey in one direction. The destination is heaven. Uh, Christians are people who have a heavenly calling. The church is people who've been given a heavenly calling, who are called to heaven, like God calling down, hey, come on up. That's what Christianity is. In Hebrews, the Christian life is a pilgrimage. It's a journey. And we, on pilgrimage, we're following our great high priest, Jesus, into the very presence of God in the most holy place. Uh, The new heavens and the new earth are that very place. Uh, That's the place that's depicted in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, the new heaven, the new earth, that is the final destination. That's where we're going. And the point of Hebrews is to say, keep going. Don't give up. You might feel like giving up, but don't give up. Don't give up. So for example, if you've got your Bibles, look at Hebrews uh, 4 verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. In other words, don't give up. Or Hebrews 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor of the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner. This is using temple language to talk about the presence of God, the the holiest place, which is where God is in heaven. Uh, Or have a look at... uh, Hebrews 10 verse 19, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. Now, this is the bit. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So that whole section is saying we can now boldly approach God in prayer. Uh, We approach him. uh, We have access to him through the blood of Jesus. And because of where we're going, keep going. Don't give up. In fact, encourage one another daily to not give up. Or Hebrews 11 verse 16. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Uh, Saying where Christians are going is this heavenly city that God's prepared for us. Again, that's that picture language of uh, Revelation 21, the glorious new city. Or how about Hebrews 12, verse 22? Uh, You've come to Mount Zion. And just before you make some assumption that he's talking about Jerusalem or on present day earth. No, he's not. You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, 
to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Again, journey we're going to, we have already arrived spiritually, but we're still waiting to get there, this heavenly Jerusalem. And finally, in Hebrews 13, the last chapter, verse 14, we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek one to come. The whole point is to keep going, keep going as a Christian. And that's the core message of this passage, keep going. The core message that every single Christian needs to hear every single day of their lives is this, consider Jesus, the apostle, the high priest of our confession. Hebrews 3 verse 1. In other words, consider Jesus. It, that translation, consider, it, it kind of sounds... It's the right word, but it just sounds so weak. It's, it's, you really want to add a few more words in, like fix your eyes on, focus on, pay attention to, consider carefully, engage your brain, put your mind to Jesus, the apostle and the high priest whom we confess. See, Jesus is the great center of the Christian life. He's the center of our lives. Uh, he is... Uh, the one whom we are to confess. So if someone says to you, you know, what do you believe? If you don't mention Jesus and you mention something else, you're really missing the boat. You're missing the central fact. Uh, for instance, if you go on about the Bible and how great the Bible is and it's written so, so, and all of this, if you go on about your church and how, how you find your church and all of that, and you don't miss, mention Jesus, you're missing the central fact. The, the Bible's fantastic. The church... Is God's church, he's at work in it. But the core of our life, the core of our confession, the core of Christianity is Jesus Christ, who's Lord. I really like how the Apostles' Creed says it. It says it so well. It words like this, I believe in God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Uh, years ago, someone once asked me, what do I believe? And I, I couldn't remember Exactly, you know, sort of younger Christian, didn't really know what do I say. And I just said, oh, I just believe what, what, how the um, Apostles' Creed starts. And I just quoted it just like that. I believe in God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. If you get those words out, you spot a message. Jesus is the great center of our lives. And this passage, the passage before us today, says God wants you to engage your brain muscle, to ponder, to think, to focus your attention on him, on Jesus. But even more specifically, to ponder his faithfulness. Ponder his faithfulness. That Jesus, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 2, was faithful to the one who appointed him. As Hebrews 12 says, it says like this, uh, Hebrews 12 uh, verse 2, keep your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that laid before him, he endured the cross, spising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The, the Christian is to look to the one who has walked the journey before us and who has landed, he's achieved, he's, he's there now. In other words, we are on a heavenly calling. We are to ponder Jesus' faithfulness in continuing on that journey through his life. If you like, we're a bit like Frodo or Bilbo Baggins and Jesus is like Gandalf. If you know the story... Gandalf's already gone on journeys. He knows this country. But Bilbo and Frodo in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, they're, they're kind of like local people. They, they don't go beyond the Shire. And yet they follow this wise man, Gandalf, because they know that he already knows. Now, Jesus is much greater than some magician in a novel. Jesus is God in the flesh who has conquered death and is now seated in heaven He's already done the journey and he is telling us now to keep focus on him and we'll get through the journey together as well. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how many times you stumble, keep
keep focus on Jesus. Because we are brothers and sisters with a heavenly call. In uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks like this and he mentions God's heavenly call. He says, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. The picture there is like God calling out of heaven, hey, Paul, look to Jesus and live. And Paul, his goal is getting that prize. God's calling from heaven. Those who are Christians are in a heavenly call. We are to ponder Jesus' faithfulness. And we are, in fact, called here holy brothers and sisters. Holiness here refers back to chapter 1, verse 3, when Jesus made purification for sins. It's interesting in the Bible because the Bible says that when someone becomes a Christian, they are now holy. They've been washed in the blood of Jesus. He, his sacrifice on the cross has forgiven them. When God looks at them, they are holy, like God. Except you and I know that as you walk every day and you wake up and you, you get about your life, you find out that, yes, you may well be truly uh, able to be thankful that God is holy and he's declared us holy, but you know at the same time that we're still sinful, we're still broken, and there's still a work of transformation going on at this time. And we won't ever fully uh, attain perfection, uh, in, in moral perfection, until we get to heaven. But in God's eyes, we are already holy. We're holy brothers and sisters. And Jesus here, we're told, is our apostle and he is our great high priest. Now, this is the interesting little phrase. Now, this is the only time in the New Testament Jesus is called an apostle. And you might notice it's a little a apostle. It's not saying Jesus is one of the 12 apostles. Uh, apostle, the 12 apostles are apostles because Jesus ch chose them and sent them out to do his work. Uh, an apostle in the original language just means a sent one. So they're his sent ones, 12 apostles, the 12 apostles. Jesus himself is an apostle. Wait, how's that? Because he's been sent by God. God sent him from heaven to live the life that we should have lived, to die the death that we deserved, so that he could bring us back to right relationship with God. Jesus was sent by the Father. He's the first ever apostle. Even before he sent his apostles, he was the one sent by God the Father. And he's also our high priest. The high priest is the one uh, that takes uh, God's people to God, brings the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Jesus is the high priest. Uh, the way this sentence is put together, it kind of jams the two ideas together. Uh, he's our high priest. He's our apostle. It's, uh, it's kind of like saying he's our high priestly apostle or he's our sent high priest. And in saying both of those things, it's covering all of Jesus' ministry from uh, on earth and his now ministry in heaven. His work as an apostle, as the sent one, he came to earth to die. And then as great high priest, he's now been sacrificed. He's now overcome the sacrifice. Uh, he has been resurrected. And now he's seated in heaven and he's interceding for us. So Jesus is both the guy who came, was sent by God, and the one who now intercedes for us as high priest. In short, focus on Jesus, because he's greater than the greatest names in the history of the world. He's greater than the greatest name in the Old Testament. The most revered man in the Old Testament, Moses, who wrote five of the books of the Bible, who saw God in a burning bush. God revealed his special name to him. God showed Moses his glory. Uh, God spoke to him face to face, as it were. God gave him uh, the, the law of the Old Testament and stone tablets. God wrote them out and gave them to him. Uh, he came back down and dealt with his people. Uh, and, and they were scared because his face was radiating because he'd been in the presence of God's holiness. This passage is saying Jesus is greater than Moses. Now, for most modern Christians, this might seem a bit weird, a bit like, yeah, of course, Jesus is greater than Moses. Duh. But don't let your familiarity blind you to what this passage is saying. 
It's saying, while Moses was incredibly faithful as the leader of Israel, not perfect, but incredibly faithful, and as the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, as amazingly as God used him, he was still only a man among men and should never be confused with who Jesus is or the worthiness of Jesus. See, Moses brought the Old Testament law. Moses did amazing things. But still, if you put him next to Jesus, there is no comparison. See, Jesus has more glory as the builder of the house. Hear me out. Chapter 3, verse 3. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory. Notice that glory. Than Moses. Just as the builder has more honour than the house. So you've got an architect and a skilled builder. The builder builds a beautiful house. But you don't say that house is more honourable or more amazing than the builder. Because the builder knows how to do it. The builder built it. He could build another one. In other words, the, the product, the house, in fact, honours his ability because he's the one who, as you see the house, you realise, wow, this guy can dream up and build amazing things. But there's a play in the word house here. The house here isn't a physical house. The house here is the people of God. Moses was a leader in the house. Jesus built the spiritual house of God. In fact, Already, back in chapter 1, verse 2, we're told that God made the universe through Jesus. So you could say, Jesus made Moses. Moses was a child of God. Jesus makes children of God. In other words, it's not a difference of degree. It's a difference of kind. A difference of degree is, you know, you, Moses dials up to 3 and Jesus dials up to 10. That, that's not the argument here. The argument is a difference of kind. It's not, it's not saying oh, you know, there's a difference between a, a poodle, a sausage dog, and a Doberman, you know, which one's bigger. It's like, it's like comparing a, a, a poodle or a wolf or a sausage dog or something with a human. Different kind. Just blows, one blows the other out of the water. This is a comparison between a man sent by God for a good work. That's Moses. And Jesus, God in the flesh, sent by God for a far superior good work. And more than that, it's comparing an honoured servant, Moses, with a son. Different quality of relationship altogether. Jesus is the son of God, not just an honoured servant, which Moses was. Moses was faithful, we're told in verse 5, as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. But Jesus was faithful as a son over his household. Servants have an obligation to faithfulness. That's their job. The master says do this and they do it faithfully. And Moses was faithful in God's house. But the son, Jesus, was faithful over the house. Jesus offered a father-son faithfulness in his work. Moses offered a servant-master kind of faithfulness. And notice what it says in verse 5. Moses was faithful as a servant, as a testimony to what would be said in the future. This verse is picking up exactly the same idea that Jesus mentions when he talks in John chapter 5, verse 46, and he says to the crowd, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. The outrageous claim, if it isn't that Jesus truly is the one prophesied from the Old Testament. See, Moses himself said that a prophet like him would come. In Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, uh, Moses says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. In verse 18, God says the same thing. You hear God speaking. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. I will hold accountable whoever does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name. When you hear that, you realize it's really important that we listen to Jesus. Of course, that's how the whole book of 
Hebrews starts. In the past, God spoke in different ways, but now he's spoken to us in his son, Jesus. So listen to him. And so here's the challenge to us. Here's the challenge of this passage. Moses pointed to Jesus. Jesus outstrips Moses in who he is and in what he's done. Jesus has come so that you may enter the glories of heaven. And therefore the question is, if Moses was faithful, which he was, he died right with God in the end. In fact, God buried his bones. We're told at the end, um, possibly so that people wouldn't dig them up and venerate them because he was so highly regarded. Moses was faithful. And if Jesus was even more faithful and even more amazingly worthy of our focus, then how's your faithfulness going? Are you in danger of losing your faith? Of not holding on? Of not focusing on Jesus, focusing on something else? Because Hebrews 3 verse 6 says, Christ was faithful as a son over the household. And we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and to the hope in which we boast. Notice what you're supposed to do? You're to look to Jesus and you're to hold on. That's what you're supposed to do. Hold on. The idea there is to keep a, a tight grip. Hold fast to the faith. Hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. Hold on to the fact that right at the moment we're on a journey and we're keeping an eye on the master who has achieved the goal and we will someday soon be with him. Hold on. Don't let go. Hold on. Don't slip away. Hold on and encourage one another to hold on too. The focus here and through all of Hebrews is that continuation in the Christian life is a test, is the test of faith. Continuation in the Christian life is the real test of faith. So starting out as a Christian, that's great. But starting out and peppering out and not continuing on, well, that just in the end proves you weren't really a true believer. Real faith is taking the next step, holding on, and looking to Jesus and not looking elsewhere. In Jesus, sins are forgiven. And you are now the people, the house of God. And every day you need to focus again and again on Jesus. And again, make sure that you keep hold. That someone once said, and I love this line, the Christian life is a long walk in the same direction. Well, that's it, isn't it? Some of us have been Christians for many years and we've seen seasons come and go in our lives. Um, many of us, we experience ups and downs. Uh, some of us have seen the sort of things that we've seen this year. They've seen it before. Maybe live through war years. We don't know how long we have in this journey. Uh, there's a time beyond which we cannot pass. Uh, God has set a time for all of us. Uh, you may live out many, many more years to go. But the challenge every day, your heavenly calling is to ponder Jesus' faithfulness in this life. To know that Jesus is greater than anyone else. Not by degrees, but by kind. He's totally different. That Jesus has more glory Jesus is the Son. And so look to Him. Look to Him and live. You are called to heaven. So focus on Jesus, He who is already there. That you may physically also one day be there in the heavenly glory of the majesty of the presence of God. Let's pray that God speeds that day. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and majesty. They belong to you. For everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. And Lord, you have established a way to heaven in Jesus Christ. 
You sent him, he's our apostle and high priest. He made the way to save us. He made the way to heal us and restore us into right relationship with you. Lord, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. You are to be exalted as head over all. Remind us of these things every day as we look to Jesus and we hold on to the confession of our faith. Amen.